Good morning. It's very early for me because I'm a West Coaster, but I just got back from a uh, one week vacation to Australia because honest, so honestly, I don't know what time it is at all. Um, I think I woke up at like four this morning and just did a little bit of work. Um, but, but thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you to Dr. Tony. Um, thank you to all the students here at Research Day and welcome. I'm really excited to take a little bit of time after I finish this talk and kind of go through those poster presentations and see the kind of research that everybody's gonna be presenting. I wanted to talk a little today about science communication and communicating your research in general. The title of my talk, I have to look, <laughs> is actually Beyond Academia, Communicating Research, Passion, and Poetry to Improve Science Literacy. This is really what I'm all about. You know, I think that communication is everything when it comes to research. What is the point of doing your research if it's not downstream going to have an effect on the current kind of progress or the current message within the community that you're doing your research in? What is the point of doing your research if you personally aren't capable of talking about that research to your friends, your loved ones, society at large, and the people who, again, downstream are going to be affected by it. And so I want to take some time today to talk about all of these different things. You know, four major points when it comes to communicating your research, I think, is that one, it helps you clarify your own problems. If you can talk about what it is you're doing to appear to the public, you're going to better understand your individual hiccups, your issues with your research. The more that you can communicate why you're doing your research, the clearer your picture of what you're actually doing is going to be. Number two, it's only fair to tell the, the taxpayers where their money's going. Most of the time, the, the, the research that we do at the university level has a lot of public funding connected to it, right? It's going to be coming through government programs. And if we can communicate what it is that we're doing, research-wise, with the public at large, they're going to be calmed, their fears may be calmed about where their money is going. You know, we, we may or may not have heard about a recent debacle. I think it was something like snails on a treadmill. Um, there's a, a, a paper that became famous because of the way that the media communicated it and said, you know, why are we wasting money on this? We're just putting snails on a treadmill. And, and I think the problem with that paper is that nobody really took the time to describe specifically what that research was representing and, and the difference between kind of basic and applied research and why we need both. And so to be able to talk about those things is very, very important. The third thing that um, I think is really important when it comes to communicating your research is that it improves literacy in our entire society. Now, I communicate science. My job, I mean, I call myself, if people ask me what I do for a living, my job is that I'm a science communicator. The reason for that is because I feel like we're in dire straits as a country right now when it comes to science literacy. You may feel that way about your own field. You may feel frustrated a lot of times by things that are so obvious to you, things that you learned, you remember, in middle school or high school. And when you talk to people in the general public, you don't understand why they don't know these basic concepts. Well, this is a literacy problem, and this is where you come in. Discussing what you do in the lab, discussing what you do in the classroom is really important for improving literacy at large. And lastly, I learned this kind of moving from my undergraduate um, education into my graduate education, as I started teaching more and more, I realized that you only really know something as well as you can teach it. I really don't think that I understood, you know, basic biology principles, basic psychology principles, even as a graduate student, until I could teach those 101 courses to other students. Because you end up the more you stay in a certain field, you end up knowing a whole lot about very little. Your research area gets very, very focused, and sometimes you forget about all of the supporting information that you need to know to be able to communicate you know, something outside of that very specific field. And so the more that you can teach, and really that's what communication of research is, it's teaching people. The more that you can teach what it is that you do, the better you're actually going to understand what it is that you do. So 
I'm going to take a little bit of time now to talk <laughs> about me, um, kind of what my story is, how I got to where I am, where I'm going, all that good stuff. I personally feel like I'm probably not that different for most of you in this room today. I grew up in a small town called, well, I shouldn't say it's small, actually. It's a pretty big town, like 250,000 people. Um, a big suburb of Dallas called Plano, Texas. Um, and I was not particularly interested in science at all. I was always into a academics. I know that I was always a relatively good student, but I was kind of a difficult student. I was one of those kids who was really into punk rock and I questioned authority and I didn't always go to class, but I did kind of keep up my grades all the time, regardless of what else was going on in my life. And I kept telling myself, all through kind of middle school and high school when I was having a difficult time that things will get different when I get to college. Things will get different when I get to college. And they did. They ended up going a completely different direction than I thought that they would, but they did get different because I think that I felt a lot more challenged once I was in uh, a more academic environment. So when I first went to uh, the university, I, I, I went to the University of North Texas actually, which is in Denton, Texas, and my intention there was to study vocal jazz performance, because I was always a singer in high school, and that's what I cared about, and that's what I thought I wanted to do. I very quickly realized that studying it at an academic level took all of the joy out of it for me. Not like that for everybody, but that's what happened for me. And I also really hated piano, and they make you take a lot of piano. Um, so I quickly realized that that probably wasn't the direction that I wanted to go. And I decided, okay, well, I know I'm in school. I know I want to get a degree. I have no idea what I want to study. I'll go with psychology because it seems easy, <laughs> you know? And so I went and I got my undergraduate degree in psychology, honestly, because I thought it would seem easy. As I got more and more involved in psychology, I realized how heavy research is in the psychology process at the academic level and how it's very, very true that psychology is not a soft science. It's a hard science, and it's very important to understand the scientific method when you're studying psychology. So I ended up getting a Bachelor of Science, doing a, a thesis, um, working with a clinical neuropsychologist, taking a bunch of extra courses in research design, in statistics, and I got excited about science. I didn't really know that that's what was happening at the time. I still thought it was very anti-science to the extent that in my undergraduate degree, I was required to take three science courses in order to fulfill my university requirement, at least one physical science, at least one life science. And I took the three science classes that I could get away with. I'm not even kidding. I took oceanography, astronomy, and I'd like to say paleontology because it makes me sound smarter, but at the time, no, no, I took a class called Dinosaurs in all capital letters with an exclamation point at the end. So it was really cool though, and it really did kind of cement my lifelong love for dinosaurs, but this was the type of student I was at that time. I quickly realized though, like I said, that psychology is science. I, I became fascinated by the brain. I became fascinated by how the brain works, and I honestly kind of felt like by the time I finished my BS in psychology that I needed more of a science background. I wanted to understand the brain at the cellular level and at the network level, so I ended up staying at the same university but switching departments and working in the biology department and getting a master's degree in neuroscience where I studied um, electrophysiology and cell culture techniques. So what we did in my lab is we would use murine tissue, mouse tissue, fetal mouse tissue, and we would plate it on these little microelectrode arrays. So it was not the same as kind of individual channel recordings in the brain, but we were actually able to record 64 channels at once. So we were able to record the electrical activity that comes off of neurons across 64 different little electrodes and compare that activity, look at network level functioning, look at how cells communicate with each other within the brain. It was really fascinating stuff. I got super interested in the chemistry of cell culture, how to grow brain cells outside of an animal and keep them healthy without antibiotics and keep them functioning the way that a normal brain functions. After that, I decided to start a PhD. Obvious next step. Wasn't sure what else to do. Wasn't sure what I wanted to be when I grew up. So I applied for um, a specific program at the City University of New York nearby. Um, 
And I went there to study clinical neuropsychology because, again, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and this gave me options. It was a PhD, but it was a clinical PhD. So I, it had a whole research component. You had to do your, your, um, your PhD thesis, your dissertation, but you also had all of this practicum and internship, and you worked with patients a lot, which sounded great for me. I put in about a year until I dropped out. I dropped out for a boy, and I moved across the country to LA, land of sun, and um, you know, just had a huge life change. I had been in academia my entire life. I had really never taken a break. And I think that at this point, I was kind of hitting burnout mode, and I was starting to learn a lot of things about myself, like while you're in school, you still have a life. It's not a preamble to living after you finally graduate. We should be making decisions that are good for our mental health as well as our academic well-being. And I realized very quickly, I, you know, as a graduate student, you have three main jobs. You have to do your research. That means spending many, many hours in the lab. You have to take your coursework. That means spending many, many hours in the classroom and the library. And most graduate students also have to teach, mostly because we're poor and we need the money. When I would survey my peers, almost all of them taught because they were poor and they needed the money. I honestly think I would have taught even if they didn't pay me. And I found myself wanting to spend so much more time in the classroom than I did in the lab. Now, this was very specific for me. And I quickly realized communicating about science is what I want to do with my life. I didn't want to be a bench scientist. I was mediocre at it. I mean, I was OK. I had a couple of publications. I wasn't doing anything groundbreaking. But I realized that when I would talk about science, People would get excited about it, and I couldn't help it. It's infectious. When you really care about something, people start to care about it too. So I started really taking survey of my life and trying to figure out, how can I do this like for a living? It's not been an easy road. I've had to pave my own way, but I've managed to kind of build my life around this idea that communicating science is what I want to do. And there's some money in it. It hasn't made me rich. It's definitely made me comfortable. And I've been very excited for all of the opportunities that it's given me. So let's see. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, so what ends up happening is that I do a few things um, kind of across different media platforms. And ultimately, I end up doing a TV show, or starting to do a TV show. It was actually a pilot for HBO called Talk Nerdy to Me. And it never got picked up, but I spent a really long time making it, and I learned a lot during the process of making it, both being on camera as a host and also being behind camera as a producer and a writer. And Ariana Huffington, over at the Huffington Post, kind of got wind of this and said, you know, we don't have a science page at the Huffington Post, and we want one because science has not been our strongest suit. We want to be able to have a specific place to communicate science there. We like that flavor of what you did for television. We think it would work better on the web. And so she invited me to come over right before they launched the science page. I actually started working there in October of 2011, and the science page didn't launch until January of 2012. So I worked there for about three months helping prepare the launch. But I also continued to make this video series called Talk Nerdy to Me. And at first it showed up on the education pages, or the green pages, or the tech pages, or whatever pages my specific stories seemed like they would fit on, until I finally had a home of my own, which was HuffPost Science. And there I was able to really grow and develop kind of this talk nerdy to me brand and this idea of exactly what my touch was and my voice was when it came to communicating science. So what I did at Huffington Post is, I mean, technically my title was I was the senior science correspondent and the host and producer of Talk Nerdy to me. Again, when people ask me what it is I do, I just say that I'm a science communicator. I like to talk about science. And I think a really important um, thing to note when we call ourselves science communicators is that we're communicators, not talkers at yours. You know, it's about having a conversation about science, which is super important. And what this job had allowed me to do for so long is to 
open up the conversation, to get into the comment section, and to really engage with people through Twitter, through Facebook, through all sorts of awesome types of social media, and have real conversations. What it is that I've been doing up until like a week ago. Um, and about a week ago, I left the Huffington Post, which has been a, a bit of a long time in coming. I've been doing more and more television work. So I'm currently co-starring on a show called Hacking the Planet on the Weather Channel, um, where my friends John Rennie, who hosts, and Brian Mallow, who's also another co-host, kind of go around the country, or actually go around the world, and look into ways that scientists are attempting to hack the planet. And what we mean by that is ways that scientists are trying to kind of harness the energy of different storm systems to use it to our advantage, or to try and divert a storm, to try and shut down a storm. And we kind of cover anything from volcanoes to hurricanes to lightning to tornadoes. Um, so this is one example of some of the TV work that I've been doing. I really urge all of you to communicate science, communicate your research, do it now, and do it often. Thanks so much, you guys.